We're talking about the catalyst. And so why don't you do this? We stand up every Sunday morning when we read the word. And so why don't you stand with me? We're going to read from the book of John. And I'm going to ask for your forgiveness up front. I'm going to read half the Bible this morning, but I think it's important. So I'm going to read a lot. This is right after Jesus fed the 5,000. He's come across the lake. He's walked across the lake. He took the expressway and walked across the lake. Some of you may remember that Peter, he encountered the disciples halfway across and, and Peter said, man, if it's you, Lord, bid me come. And he steps out of the boat and he walks a little bit on the water. By the way, don't hate on Peter. He's the only one other than Jesus that walked on water. I know there's that little gecko on National Geographic, but that doesn't count. So we're going to pick up right after that. Now Jesus and all the disciples are on the other side of the lake. And Jesus is having an encounter with people. And this is the way it goes. John chapter 6, starting at verse 25, it says, When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? That's a good question. They didn't see Jesus get in the boat with the disciples. They knew he didn't get in the boat with any of them. But they get to the other side of the lake and they're like, dude, he's here. So they've got questions. When did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which a son of man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed a seal of approval. Then they asked him, what, what, what must we do to do the good works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Don't you love it when people quote the scripture to the scripture? Jesus is the word made flesh and dwelt among us. And here are people quoting him back to him. Well, this is what it's written. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he's given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Come on, that's good, isn't it? All right, we're not done yet. Hold on. This, is, this thing's about ready to go sideways. Everything sounds great up to now. It's getting ready to go totally sideways. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So Jesus just crosses a line with them. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has ever seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who be believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Therefore, uh, this bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? I told you, it's getting ready to go sideways. 
Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up to the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, Whoa! Look at your neighbor and said, I'm about ready to leave church. They said, whoa, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples are grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the, fl- the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which one would believe, to to whom would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Father, we thank you this morning. We pray this not be a Easter like before, God, but we pray that you transform our heart and minds. We pray that because you touched us this morning, God, we'd be different. Not different for a while, but different permanently. Lord, that eternal life would be in us because we believe on you. We thank you for this opportunity we have together. We pray, Lord, that we take advantage of it. Jesus' mighty name and everyone said, amen and amen. All right, you may be seated. Now, I told you a little bit before Jesus had been up on the other side of the lake, up on the mountainside, teaching. They needed some dinner. They didn't have much food, so the disciples brought to him what they could scrounge up from a young man. And Jesus does a miracle and feeds 5,000 men, the Bible says. Add to that women and children. Back then, they were prolific. No, 2.5 kids. So you can imagine how many people ate their fill. And then the Bible says they collected baskets full. I want to pose to you sometimes in life, God does miracles and you don't understand the miracle or even that it even happened. And I believe that's a problem in our lives. When God can reach down his hand and do something dramatic and we not even notice it or understand it. And the reason I say that is because Because the Bible says that his disciples just didn't get it. They didn't understand. So they come to the other side of the lake. He sends the disciples off. They get in the boat. They row across the other side of the lake. Halfway across, Jesus meets them walking on the water. Now, it's convenient if you don't want to get your robe wet. You just walk on top of it. So he walks across the water meets them halfway. They're scared. They think he's a ghost. And Peter says, if it's you, Lord, bid me come. And Jesus says, sure, Peter, get out of the boat. Let's do it. So Peter takes one step out of the boat, another step out of the boat. Next thing you know, he's walking on the water. But we've talked about this before. His situation changes a little bit. The thing that scared, didn't scare Peter in the boat now makes him terrified outside of the boat, the winds and the waves. And so Peter begins to sink a little bit, but don't fret when you step out in faith and it doesn't work out the way you want it to all the time. Jesus is there to catch you by the hand and give you strength. Amen? So now we're on the other side of the lake. The Bible says Jesus is in in a synagogue and people ask him, how did you get over on the other side of the lake? And he doesn't answer them straight, which I always love about Jesus. Never get a straight answer. (laughs) So they ask him, how can we do the right thing here? How can we? Now you have to remember, the Jewish culture was based on works. It was based on, I have to do the right thing to be accepted by God. Jesus was coming along, fulfilling all the, the whole law. And so Jesus makes sure he tells them, listen, There's nothing you have to do except believe on me. 
So what struck me about this story is they get on the other side of the lake and they have no reference point for what had just happened while they were on the far side of the lake. And oftentimes in our lives, we can forget what God has already done for us. Somebody say amen. Because what he did yesterday was great, but I have a new need this morning. Amen? Now, I would say that it benefits us as husbands. Let me, let me step back a little bit and give you some uh, marriage advice or just advice in general for men. Maybe, you work with, maybe you're not married, but you work with a lady. It is never good to forget what a lady has already done for you. Somebody say amen. I'm trying to help you out here today, husbands. I'm trying to help you out. Because what can oftentimes happen in our households is that new needs arise and we forget that she's been cooking your meals for the last 15 years or 20 years or some of you for 40 years. And you wake up and there's a new circumstance and all of a sudden you've forgotten all that has happened before. All the ladies. This is your shot. I'm giving you, I'm giving you a free swing. We forget. So the people come to Jesus. How'd you get across the lake? Ah, forget about it. Then they say, hey, what can we do? Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you, why don't you tell us what we can do to be right? And Jesus says, believe on him. Believe on the one who came. Believe on me, essentially is what he's saying. They say, do us a sign so we can believe in you. I'm thinking, he just fed all of you. Matter of fact, he tells them that. He says, you didn't come over here to see me. You came over here because I gave you something to eat. So he calls them out right away. He says, you came to see me today. Not because I'm special to you, but because I fed you yesterday. Ah. You think this is Chick-fil-A. You think this is McDonald's. You think Jesus is a drive through You think it's just, I need some more bread, and so I'm going to come and see Jesus. And he says, no, no, no. That's not what this is about. Well, how do we do the right thing? Do the right thing by believing in me. Oh, okay. Well, do something for us. Show me something. Show me why I should believe in you. And it struck me that less than 24 hours ago, he had already showed them. That he, had already, that he had already fed them. That he could get across the lake without them even knowing how he did it. But they're still coming to him, asking him, hey, show me something so I can believe in you. Show me something. Can I pose to you this morning that if we live our lives always forgetting what he's already done, then we'll always be asking for more and more and more and more and more. We will never be satisfied as long as we forget what he's already done. Amen? It's like sitting down to a meal after somebody has sweated, not sweated over it, but sweated making it. It's like sitting down over a meal and go, man, this would have been nice with some, you fill in the blank. You know what you want to do? You just want to punch them in the mouth right? Well, it'd be nice if you could eat it with all your teeth in. Here's the fact of the matter. Jesus came for God sent his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Bible says. He came and lived the perfect life. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, but did not sin. He he knows how to relate to us because he's been where we've been. He's, he's, he's been tempted by what we've been tempted by. He's overcome everything, death, hell, and the grave. And he died on the cross for your sin and my sin, paying the penalty for where we should have been. He rose again on the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in us. And we consistently come back to him and acting like it's not enough. Show me something else before I believe. Change my circumstance today and I may believe you tomorrow. Well, the problem is, is we have a moving target for God. If he, if he fixes what ails us today, then tomorrow we wake up with another fix. If he fixes what ails us tomorrow, then tomorrow we wake up and say, God, I'll believe on you today if you do X, Y, and Z. And he says, listen, I've done enough. I've done enough. I've done enough. 
Don't you remember? I just fed all of you people. You, you can't even figure out how I got across the lake. And now you're asking me for another sign? The problem with modern day Christianity is we are inviting Jesus to fix our circumstances and not us. We're inviting him in saying, if you fix all this stuff around me, I'll be better. Here's the reality. He's the catalyst for change. Now watch how this works. So I looked it up on the dictionary. On the dictionary. Because the dictionary is online, right? I looked it up in the dictionary. The definition for catalyst is in the dictionary is something added to something else that starts or accelerates a chemical reaction, but in and of itself doesn't change. So a catalyst is something that you take and you add to other things and it begins or accelerates a reaction, a chemical change, but the catalyst in and of itself doesn't change. Oh, come on, that's good. So Jesus did not come to fix what's around you. He came to fix you. He didn't die for your circumstances. He died for you. So what happens is, when we twist it up, we say, Jesus, come on down here. Show me a trick. Make my boss like me. Make my wife like me. Make my kids like me. Make everybody on Facebook like me. Make Instagram like me. Make the government like me. Please, make the IRS like me. Come on, it's almost April 15th. Jesus said, I didn't come for that. I came to change you. I came to transform your life. I didn't die for circumstances. I didn't die to make people like you. I didn't die so every morning you wake up with the birds chirping and there's, no, there's, there's nothing wrong in you. I didn't die for any of that. I died to give you life. And what he tells them is this. He said, the bread of heaven has come down. And if you'll receive it, you'll receive eternal life. And they're like, can I get something to eat? No, 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 no. You don't get it. You're still asking me just for situational change. You're asking me to change and give you a better house or a better car. You're asking me to give you a better meal. You're asking me to give you better relationship. I came to change you. I, oh, somebody almost started clapping right in this area. Watch, watch. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back up. So if our mentality is, I don't really remember what you did for me yesterday, but I need you to do something for me today. Listen, God doesn't barter with salvation. Did you know that? It's not like a bargaining tool. He says, well, maybe, you know, okay, well, I really want to save you, so I'm going to... I'm going to fix this in your life. I'm going to do something nice for you today so you believe in me. Do you see what happened when they started challenging him? He didn't change. He came as the catalyst to cause a change in people. And when people demanded a change from him, he didn't. Because the catalyst doesn't change. So watch what happens. He he comes, they come to him and they say, hey, how'd you get here? Well, forget about it. <laughs> hey, this is what we want from you. Show us a sign. We want to believe in you. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. He says, no. No, I'm not showing you a sign. Matter of fact, here's what I'm going to tell you. Now get ready. Hold on to your seat. You're going to say, man, I came to Easter service and they're talking about eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood. I'm not sure I'm at the right church. Here's what, they, here's what he says. Not only does he not change the conversation, he ups it. And he says, if you want eternal life, eat the bread that came down from heaven. By the way, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no place. What? It says they looked at each other and said, this is a hard teaching. You know what translated that in a crisp paraphrase is? This man's crazy. He just walked in here and told us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I don't even know what he's talking about. Grab the kids, honey. We're pulling them out of Sunday school. We're out of here. They're probably, they're probably eating flesh in the back. I don't know what's going on. 
This place is nuts. This Jesus has jumped off the deep end. Talking about eating, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He says it multiple times. And I'm thinking, why is he doing this? Because if it were me, can I let you in a little bit on public speaking? The dynamic that happens. I do weddings, nobody claps. I do funerals, nobody claps. I compare them together a lot. Do you guys see the similarities to weddings and funerals? There's death involved in both. Okay, focus. So, so a speaker like like me, I'm going to be transparent with you. We can oftentimes be swayed by crowds because, because the reaction to the, to the message can either turn you one way or the other sometimes. Now, watch why this is important. So if I'm preaching in a certain area and you're just clapping, yeah, I was in, I, my, my first trip to Africa, I preached at a church. I've told some of you this some times. I preached in the church. No lie. This is the best sermon I've ever preached. I don't even remember what I said. Best sermon I've ever preached. You know why? Because at one point in time during the sermon, everybody was standing up. I don't even know what they were saying. Scream. They could have been saying, get out of the building. I didn't know. But they were screaming at me, handkerchiefs in their hands, going like this. And I know the pastor was standing over here going, who is this Chris Jones? And I was like, this is as good as it gets, man. This is amazing. They all love me. They really love me. And I was just like, Yara. I don't even, I have no idea what the sermon was about. I could go back and check my notes. I have no idea. I couldn't tell you today what it was about. But it was awesome. It was amazing. The best sermon I've ever preached. The best. You know what the issue is there? If you do it long enough, you got to be careful about the applause. Sometimes in our life, we have to be careful about the applause. And what I noticed about Jesus was, matter of fact, there was no applause. They started grumbling about him, and he did not change. He didn't go, Peter, they don't like my sermon. They don't like me talking about, they don't like me talking about bread from heaven. I don't know. That's all I prepared today. I don't have anything else to say to them. Uh, You know, they want me to do something for them, but I really feel like I should tell them the bread from heaven has come down and they can receive salvation. And I really feel like it's, do me a favor. Stop telling people what you feel like. Just do the right thing. Oh, you're going to clap there too. Anyway, so Jesus does not change the message because the crowd has difficulty with it. Jesus doesn't change the message because the crowd goes, oh man, this is a tough saying. Who, who can accept all this? Who can, who can understand this? He doesn't change the reason he came because the people that he came to didn't accept it. Nothing changed about it. He's the catalyst. So he said, I came to change you. This doesn't work the opposite way. Just because you can't grasp what the eternal son of the living God says doesn't mean I need to change the message. Boy, this is culturally relevant for today, isn't it? Turn on your TV and people of faith are sidelined every time somebody doesn't understand what they say. And we want to switch. Oh, we got to, we got to make it palatable. We got to make it palatable. We got, to, we got to talk about it the right way. We got to dress it up the right way. Jesus said, listen, unless you eat this flesh and drink this blood, you have no part. Matter of fact, the longer they went, the worse this conversation got. I'm like, Jesus, man, just lighten up a little bit. Get a clap. Get them, work them up. You know, send them that tough stuff in an email. You, you, know, you don't have to do it all on Sunday. You don't have to do it all in church. You know, just send it every now and then. Just, you know, say really nice stuff and then just interlace it with the difficult things so they can accept it. But he didn't. He didn't come to change. He came to change us. So he tells them. He tells them, 
Matter of fact, <laughs> matter of fact, they decided they were walking away from him. And he didn't change. And I ask myself that sometimes. Chris, because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us if we're believers. Amen? So Jesus was a catalyst. Come from heaven. Put on us. Put in us to change us, but he yet is not changed. He came down from the Father, the one and only Son, full of glory. Came when he touches us. There's a reaction. There's a change that happens. Your life is never the same. The Bible says that old things pass away and all things become new. You're not the same person. You were bought with a price, the Bible says, that he shed his blood for you. He atoned for your sins and he resurrected. And that resurrection power is on you and in you and changes you permanently. Amen? It changes you. So watch this. So watch. People started walking away. It said a ton of disciples decided not to follow him anymore. <laughs> it's all fun and games so people stop dropping you on Facebook. I'm going to stand up for what's right. Man, my friend count went down to like 50. It's all fun and games till the, till the family members start calling you, telling you cut it out. It's all fun and games it's all great when everybody's okay. But Jesus is standing there, and it's almost like on purpose he's talking about this. And people just start saying, we can't do it. We're, we're, we can't follow you anymore. And he's okay with it. And I started thinking to myself, I started thinking, wow, that's pretty impressive that he could do that. I started thinking about a catalyst. You're right, God. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Job said no plans of him, his could be thwarted. What, what God's will is in heaven will happen on earth. It will happen. God is God. He was there from the beginning. He'll be there in the end. He was there before the beginning started. will be after the end is over. He is unwavering, unchanging, uncompromising. He is everything that you can imagine a God should be and would be and more than you can imagine. So... What happens is when God doesn't change, it irritates us. <laughs> you know why? Because I want justice when he is giving mercy. And I want him to change. Yeah. I want vengeance when he is blessing. And I say, whoa, you got to fix that. They did X, Y, and Z to me, and I want you to fix it right now. I want you to fix it. I want you to slap them around a little bit. Shake things up. I want you to punish somebody because they did something to me. And God says, I'm long-suffering. I'm trying to save their soul, not fix your circumstance. <laughs> oh, come on. I heard somebody in the back. Hey, Amen. Watch. If I'm always counting on God to fix my circumstance and not fix me, then I will always be unsatisfied the results I get from God. I will always be unsatisfied with the results I get from him because he didn't come to fix all of my circumstances. He came to fix me. So if my, if my prayer life and my, and my conversations with God is God, all oh, fix this, fix this, fix this. He said, I came to fix you. And if I fix you, it doesn't matter what else happens. I'm getting ready to give you the key to life right here. So I started thinking, what happens when the catalyst touches you? What happens when the catalyst really gets a hold of you and that reaction takes place? The catalyst doesn't change, but what he touches does change. And this is when I realized of how the gospel goes forward because he's a catalyst for everything. He came down, he touches us. And then watch this. Because he touches us, the same power that was in him, the Bible says, is now in us. Amen? So that means we can be in the world, but not of it. Well, that's an old school scripture right there. How many give it up for the old school song we sang this morning? I told Pastor Sam, you sing, I said, you sing that song, they'll love you. They'll love you. 
That's what it's all about. (laughs) So watch. I started realizing, when I started looking through Scripture at people that the catalyst had changed, they became like the catalyst, unchangeable. I started noticing that when the catalyst touched people, their circumstances mattered less. They weren't swayed by the opinions of man anymore. They weren't swayed by their circumstances. Pain couldn't push them off of the goal. Circumstances couldn't push them away. Loss of friends couldn't push them away. Being unpopular couldn't push them away. The catalyst that is unchanging came down and touched them. And in, and in turn, after they were changed, they became the catalyst. Now watch how this happens. You look at Peter and James and John and all the guys that the first century church started in the New Testament in Acts. It says they went out after they were empowered by the Holy Spirit and almost everything they did was against what people thought they should do. They go out and preach, they get arrested. I don't know if it was me, I'd be on on the phone with my wife, baby, I got arrested. Can you come down and get me out? I don't know if I should preach anymore. I mean, really, they arrested me today for preaching. I thought they liked me. But they arrested me for preaching. Now my feelings are hurt, and I don't know what to do. Peter stands up in front of the leaders and says, whether you think it's right to serve you, we think it's right to serve God. So you can lock us up as many times as you want to lock us up. But the catalyst has touched me. He's changed my life forever. And so now my circumstances don't matter as much. So you can lock me up, throw away the key. It don't matter. I can be sick. I can be healthy. I can be anything now. It does not matter because he touched me. Look at Paul's life. We talked about it about a couple, about a month ago. Paul, Paul says, man, I've been beaten been whipped, shipwrecked, spent a night on the open ocean. I'm not changing. I came in contact with the, the living God. He changed me. It don't matter what circumstance I get in now. I'm, I'm in touch with him. It doesn't, it does not matter. Matter of fact, Paul writes it like this. He writes it like this in Philippians chapter one, verse 12 through 18. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, everybody paying attention now, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. You know what happens when you are touched by the catalyst is that you start looking at your circumstances in a totally different light. It's not Jesus come fix it, it's how can you now use it? It's now you've changed me, I'm not swayed by the circumstance. Matter of fact, I don't even look at the circumstance the same way. I'm looking at the circumstance six months ago, I'd have been bawling like a little baby in the corner and you'd have to come wrap your arms around me. But, but, but today, I realize that I don't have to change because he's touched me and that this circumstance can be used for the gospel. I got a totally different look. You have to remember, you're not the same anymore. It changes our outlook. Paul said, I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel as a result. It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, I ain't changing. Paul's not even praying to get out of it. Paul's not even praying for him to release the chains. Paul's not praying for him to deliver him. He's been transformed by the Son of God. He's been transformed by that resurrection power. And now it dwells in him. And he says, I don't need you to deliver me anymore. I need you to use me where I am. Totally transforms the situation. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord And dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Watch this. Jesus came down, touched Paul. Paul touched other people. And now other people are being unchanged. Did you see that? Now people in the palace guard are more confident than ever in Christ. And now they're preaching without fear. You see how this... At this church, we talk about far and wide all the time. We talk about... 
We're going to take the gospel as far and wide as God will give us the ability to go. Far and wide, far and wide. We're going to push the gospel out there. We want grace. We want everybody to inherit eternal life. I mean, I mean, it's Easter, right? Right, that's what he came for, right? <laughs> Resurrected. They're like, no, nah, this is pretty good. Just this many, that's fine. I don't want to get heaven too crowded, you know. Get a trash problem. We want all inherit to all to inherit eternal life. We want the we want the same for everybody. We want you to believe on Christ. And at that last moment, what he just told the people, he said, "What if what if you see me ascend, and I'll take all you with me? 